So let's finish up this second module. And I want to talk about something that we've talked about indirectly, but I want to be much more specific. And this is the idea of rehypothecation. Uh, this is a concept that is very well known in traditional finance, but it's important to understand in the context of decentralized finance. And I can't help but use an example. Um, we've talked about having uh, collateral. And if you're borrowing, you need to have collateral. And we've gone through examples of what happens if you go below your collateralization ratio. The keepers will come in and close you out. So I want to contrast that with the high profile situation uh, that happened in 2021 with a large family office that essentially uh, went under because they were under collateralized and there was no automatic uh, mechanism. So, so let me start this with a quote um, from a description of the Archegos uh, situation. And it is remarkable uh, because it really shows the difference between centralized um, finance and decentralized uh, finance. So I'm actually going to read this. And this is from uh, Matt Levine. Once you know the right amount of collateral and you call up the hedge fund to tell it to post more collateral, and then the hedge fund says, I'm busy today, let's talk tomorrow. And then you call them tomorrow and they say, hey, this week got away from me, but send me an email. And you send them an email summarizing your collateral demand and call them next week. And they say, oh, I haven't had a chance to look at your email yet, but I will very soon. And meanwhile, the right amount of collateral keeps ticking up. What do you do about that? There is a theoretical and contractual answer, which is if the client doesn't post the collateral you want, then you terminate the swap. But you are the person and the hedge fund does sound really busy and surely it can't hurt to talk to them tomorrow. Plus, if you terminate the swap, you lose their business and your whole job is about doing more business. So this is uh, a powerful uh, situation where um, investment banks, investment banks lost billions of dollars in this particular uh, blow up. It was clear what the collateral uh, needed to be. It was clear that the hedge fund or family office was underwater, but there was no mechanism. It was email, phone call, delay, delay, delay. So that's much different than decentralized uh, finance. So let's talk about rehypothecation and what does that actually mean? So hypothecation is simply pledging collateral. So just a, a fancy word for um, pledging collateral uh, for debt. So you might pledge your house uh, for mortgage debt. That's an example. Or a factory might pledge their plant uh, for, uh, for some debt from the bank. So Rehypothecation is when the collateral that you post to the bank or the brokerage is actually reused by the bank. Okay, so uh, this idea of reusing collateral has got uh, a long history, and sometimes this is called repledging, sometimes it's called reuse of collateral. And within centralized finance, there are specific rules that you need to follow uh, regarding this reuse of collateral, in particular, uh, the Fed regulation uh, T. Of course, in the space of decentralized finance, there are no rules. There's no centralized authority that's regulating anything in decentralized finance. And you might think, oh, well, uh, there are regulated exchanges in the US, like Coinbase or the US branch of uh, Binance. Well, that's true. But remember, they are centralized. 
So they deal in decentralized finance, but they are centralized. What I'm talking about is uh, the theme of this learning experience, which is decentralized finance. So the equivalent are uh, the decentralized uh, exchanges. There are some issues that we'll talk about a little later in terms of risk, um, but there is no regulation like this. Everything is algorithmic. So I want to talk uh, a bit about a concept in decentralized finance called total locked value. And one way to think about that is you put money into a liquidity pool, and that is kind of the, the value that has been pledged into the system. And the equivalent in banking might be the amount of deposits uh, that a bank actually has. Okay, so, so we've, we've talked about this in terms of MakerDAO and Compound, Aave, Uniswap, uh, and, and other uh, protocols that we've uh, dealt with. And they call it lock value, but it's really misleading uh, to call it lock value because they're not really locked. So if you, if you want to withdraw, you can withdraw at any point. There's no uh, barrier to actually doing that. Indeed, it's much more difficult uh, to do it in, in centralized uh, finance. So we need to be diff you know, careful in terms of how we count that lock value. Okay, so, um, so essentially what I'll talk about is that if there is this rehypothecation, then you might be counting uh, the collateral uh, multiple uh, times. So what do I mean by that? Uh, and I think the best way to get the intuition as to what this means is to go back to centralized finance and talk about something called the money multiplier which maybe you were introduced uh, to in an introductory uh, macroeconomics uh, course. So somebody deposits $100 at a bank. And the bank, according to the Federal Reserve regulations, has to have a reserve at the Fed of, let's say, 10%. So 10 of those dollars is parked at the Fed. But then the bank can take the other 90 and lend it out. So let's think about that. Uh, somebody borrows 90 from the bank, and then they take that and deposit it at another bank. So uh, the second bank has to go through the same process. They've got $90 deposited. Uh, the regulations say that 10% needs to sit at the Fed. So that means that they're able to lend out 81. And this process just continues to go. And you can see that that initial deposit of $100 actually generates a lot of uh, lending. Indeed, it, at the limit, it, it actually creates um, $1,000. So you just take the initial amount and divide by the reserve uh, requirement, which is point. One a zero. So this is the idea of uh, a money multiplier that an initial deposit uh, can actually multiply itself uh, throughout uh, the system. Okay, so the same idea applies to decentralized finance. So let's go through uh, an example of how this uh, might happen. So uh, I put some numbers to this example. Uh, so you can appreciate um, the, uh, the actual mechanics. So let's say in this case, a user deposits $1,500 of wrapped uh, ether into Maker, which we've talked about, and gets a loan of 100 dies, or 1,000 die, which is the equivalent of $1,000. So this implies a collateralization ratio of 150%, which is about in the ballpark of what we actually uh, dealt with when we were talking about uh, MakerDAO. So you've got the 1,000 die, and um, the user then deposits that 1,000 die along with 1,000 USDC into a Uniswap die USDC uh, pool. So think about what the user's done here. The user's deposited $1,500, 
and $1,000 of USDC. So the total investment of the user is $2,500. And it's a combination of wrapped uh, ETH and USDC. So then Uniswap issues their liquidity token that represents $2,000. So the user could actually redeposit, and that I'm underlined the re, because this is the whole idea of what I'm talking about here. So the user could redeposit the liquidity tokens into Maker and get another loan of 1960 DAI. So notice that when you're depositing uh, the liquidity tokens, given that they're based upon a stablecoin pool of DAI and USDC, the collateralization ratio is really low. It's 102%. Uh, okay, so let's actually go through to see what's happening here. So to calculate the total lock value, we've got uh, $1,500 of wrapped ETH. We've got $1,000 of liquidity added in USDC. We've got liquidity added to um, a, a Uniswap pool uh, of 1,000 DAI. And then we've got the liquidity tokens that are worth 2,000. So if you add all this up, it comes to $5,500. But notice that the amount pledged is only $2,500. So think of this as the first round of the money multiplier that I just described in uh, centralized uh, finance. So um, this could continue uh, to go on in terms of repledging uh, that collateral, and we would come to much more than $5,500 worth of collateral. So the formula for the maximum amount is not as simple as in centralized finance. So in centralized finance, it's really straightforward. Uh, you take the deposit, divide by the um, required reserve, um, point 0.1 in my example. But notice in the example that we just went through, there were two um, collateralization ratios. So in the risky uh, pool, it was 150%. And in the pool that had two stable coins, the ratio was only 102%. So the formula is not as simple as it is uh, for a bank, but the same idea obtains. And this is how it's possible that, uh, indeed, the number of DAI in the system could be more than the number of DAI actually issued. In the same way that the number of dollars in the system might be more than the number of dollars printed by the central bank. So this is an important uh, concept uh, of kind of reusing a collateral and is very common in decentralized uh, finance. And indeed, it's very important in terms of how uh, the system actually works. And I do want to emphasize that this is all algorithmic. You've got a collateralization ratio. And if at any point in time, and we're talking about a point in time that is approximately 18 seconds. So if you pierce the bound in terms of the collateralization ratio, then you're going to be closed out by a keeper. And the keepers are incented to actually do that. There's no, as I said at the beginning, email or telephone call or an appointment next week. This is done rapidly and efficiently. And in doing that, it preserves the confidence of the system. And that's really important in terms of people using it in the future.